Hey guys, what's up? It's River and today we're doing a tutorial on the Nikon D5600. I'm going to show you how to set this camera up for the absolute best photo and video quality out of this camera, how to harness the very powerful and impressive focusing system in this camera, and how to set this camera up for different shooting environments, including how to set this camera up for portraits and sports mode. And lastly, a bonus tip that I promise all of you will find very, very helpful. Without further ado, let's get into it. Also, just to let you guys know, there's a link in the description down below for the absolute best pricing on this camera. So if you are interested in this camera, be sure to check that out. Okay guys, so first things first, let's look at the information menu. If you go right here, you'll hit this I button. It'll bring up the information menu. And right here at the very left, you'll see something called basic. And, or it might say something else, but this is your image quality tab. And from here, you can pick the different image quality you wanna shoot. Now, if you shoot basic, get a low quality image that you know, is probably not really good for anything other than just posting on the internet. Couldn't really do much, too, too much editing with it. Um, but you will get a lot more shots. As you notice, there's a number at the bottom that decreases as you go up in image quality. And if you just shoot something called raw, now that is the highest level of fidelity that you can get out of the photos in this camera. But as you notice, you get only 129 instead of your regular, um, you know, like a thousand photos. What I recommend to most people is you shoot raw plus basic. Now that gives you 115 photos. You'll get the raw image, but you'll also get basic. So you could send it over to a client or someone that you're sharing these photos with. And with that, you could actually send them all the basics, which are really quick. You could just email those photos over. And then you have the raw for like the editing and stuff. If you're doing any kind of work where you need to share stuff with a client. And right next, the at the very end, you see something called raw plus JPEG fine. Now fine JPEG is like a very high quality version of JPEG. Some people, I know some photographers that will, they're like, yeah, I'll just shoot JPEG. I don't really recommend that. I think if you got a nice camera, use it to its full potential. But I do know some photographers that just shoot JPEG. They don't want to bother with raw and they like to bake the look right into the camera. Um, to be honest, that's just personal preference. But if you want the highest fidelity, shoot NEF raw plus JPEG fine and you get 88 shots. Again, that is not that many shots, but I already, but this is only a 16 gigabyte card. So depending on how big of a card you can afford, you could get more photos. But if you're just shooting this as like a hobby, I think something like normal JPEG, five, 552, or um, just fine JPEG, 281 should be good enough. But uh, that is the menu for uh, image quality. And depending on your needs, you should pick something different. The other thing that I wanted to go over is um, the if you pick, let's say, just JPEG, your image size can vary. Like you can get a small, a medium or you can get a large and now this doesn't affect your sensor crop size or anything but it just depends on how big of a JPEG container you're working with so if you notice if I go to small here and then I can still shoot fine but I'll get a lot more photos in my fine whereas if I shoot large I get a lot less photos in my fine um, so yeah, that's another thing because what this JPEG container relates to is the bit depth and what this relates to is your overall resolution. That's kind of nerdy and techy. If you're a techie, you totally understood what I just said. If you're someone that's pretty new to cameras, you're like, what? Um, if you're pretty new, what I recommend doing is just shooting large all the time because you're going to get the best image quality of your JPEGs. And if depending on if you want to shoot JPEG or RAW, just pick whichever one fits your needs. All right guys, next I wanna go over how to get the best of video quality. Now, if we hit the I menu here and we go into set picture control, you'll notice that there's different picture profiles, standard, neutral, vivid, monochrome, portrait, landscape, and flat. Now, what you wanna do is either go with neutral or flat. What this will do is give you a much flatter and desaturated video profile so that way you can do a little bit of tweaking. Again, as I mentioned in my review, be sure to check that out, that it's not the best video camera, but it is a pretty good video camera. Like it's, it's you know, it's like decent. It's like it does the job, but it's not the best for post-processing because it doesn't have any cinematic uh, picture profiles. But what I have discovered is that the neutral and flat do a pretty good job. I prefer flat over neutral, but you know, experiment, see what you like best. But if you go with flat, you'll actually see you get a pretty flat looking thing. Now these are my Blade Runner posters, but if you see that I go into FL 
and I go over different things, like you can see how those color change and I find flat gives me the most dynamic range. Neutral makes things a little too flat and milky. Um, I find flat actually looks better than neutral. Um, neutral is just a little too milky. Vivid is way too contrasty. Um, yeah, I, I think flat looks the best. And the other thing I want to show you guys is if you go into menu, you'll see a bunch of these menus pop up. You want to go into this middle menu right here that has the camera logo and you want to keep scrolling down and you'll see a menu called movie settings. Now this menu is way too hidden in my opinion, but if you go right here, you'll see frame rate size and frame rate. Now from here, you can pick different resolutions and frame rates. I love doing slow motion, so I usually shoot everything I ever shoot, like at any time, at uh, 1920 by 60. Um, this gives you a full HD image and 60 frames per second, so you can slow that down. But if you're shooting something that's more like narrative driven, if you're vlogging, I don't recommend shooting in 60. That motion blur looks kind of weird and awkward. I recommend shooting in 1920 by 24. Make sure you pick 24, not 25. 25 is for PAL regions. Uh, if you're shooting in America, shoot 60, not 50. But if you're in Europe or in PAL regions, uh, be sure to shoot 50 or 25. But uh, I'm assuming most of us are in North America. So we're going to go with either 24 or 60. And right below that is movie quality. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of setting this to normal. Make sure you set this to high quality. Uh, microphone. Now, depending on what's up, you can either turn your microphone on or off. Depending on what you're shooting, you will save a bit of data that way. But I like to obviously keep it on. And do, 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 well, how do I turn this thing on again? There we go. Auto sensitivity and um, noise reduction. I usually keep that off. I just like to have a solid microphone. Wind reduction in camera is usually not the greatest for any brand. I prefer to just uh, get a quality mic. And you'll see manual movie settings here. This camera does a really good job doing auto with uh, movie settings where it'll just kind of change the exposure and aperture for you. I personally prefer controlling my image, so I always leave manual movie settings on. But if you're someone that just wants to vlog or just kind of shoot some movie video stuff or some movie stuff uh, for funsies and isn't too concerned about the image and getting specific things in there, like you're just like, I need to record stuff and it's more content than cinematic, then you can leave that as off. All right, friends, and now the next thing we're going to talk about is the focusing system in this camera. Now, this camera has really spectacular autofocusing, and it's actually pretty easy to understand. Now, we're going to start with AF area mode. Now, what this controls is what area of the autofocusing system are you using? Now, you can go to subject tracking, where if something's moving, it will track for you. This is actually really, really good. I was surprised that you had such a good feature in such a like a mid and like entry level camera. Um, however, I personally find myself shooting things like landscape and cityscape. So I usually don't tend to use it, but if you think you're gonna be shooting sports or things moving around, definitely use subject tracking. It's very, very useful, especially if you're using people. Face tracking is really, really good. If there's any people in your subject, they will automatically track to that. It's very, very useful. And then there's normal area where just kind of, it, all the focus points are just in the middle and wide is if you're shooting landscapes. Now, if you're not shooting landscapes, this really doesn't do anything, and most of us will be fine just shooting normal. Next, we're gonna go into focus mode. Now, in focus mode, you have two modes, single servo autofocus or full-time servo, and then there's manual focus. Manual focus, we're just, just changing the focus by hand on this little thing right here, and you're just going chit, 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 and it's changing your focus. Um, let me just make sure everything's in focus here, and burp. Let me just make sure the camera's in focus, yep. Now, single servo is if you take a single photo of someone that's like stationary and they're not moving. So if you just take it, you'll lock focus to that and then you'll just keep taking photos at that same focus point. Now, full-time servo is if something is moving in an, like around your frame and you want the camera to track as they get closer or farther away from your camera, that's something full-time servo would be very useful for. As you can see, there's a little surfer right there. For shooting sports, that's what I would recommend using a uh, full-time server for. I actually find that this camera is really good and you know Nikon makes some of the best cameras out there, but I find that if you're shooting 
uh, with other brands and you use full-time servo when you should really be using single servo, camera can tend to get confused and it'll pick up movements that it really doesn't need to. Uh, so depending on what you're doing, I usually just leave it on full-time servo uh, because the autofocus in this camera is so good, but you know, something just something good to know what these focus modes do if you're shooting uh, someone stationary single, if you're shooting someone that's moving around full time. Now, chances are, as you adventure and experiment with this camera, you will be shooting a variety of things. And there's actually a mode dial right here. And there's something called scene. Now, when you switch to scene and you change this dial right here, it will actually go to different scene modes where it will set the settings up for you depending on what you're shooting. So you can get portrait, food, um, autumn colors, like just, anything you can imagine this camera has really just got you covered however i don't know exactly what most of these settings do you can experiment around with them but i find portrait will give you a pretty flat depth of field it will give you nice colors and it will just kind of auto um what's the word optimize the lighting for you so you can shoot all these things again like i don't know what the difference between shooting a child and a portrait would be but either way it's just gonna it's what nikon thinks these subjects would look best in and and it will just kind of optimize the settings in terms of color and latitude for you. So that's a pretty uh, useful thing to do, but it's good to know how the camera actually works. So we're gonna explain how to set this camera up for portrait and how to set this up for photos that are fast moving, such as sports. So next we're gonna go over how to set this camera up for portrait mode. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna shoot your lens at something between a 55 to a 35, depends on what lens you have on this camera. But generally the higher the focal length, the closer you will get to your subject and the flatter their face will look. And a flat face is more flattering on a photo than a wide angle lens because a wide angle lens will kind of distort the face, make the nose look bigger, make the head look, kind of the forehead look too big. Generally celebrities, especially in movies, are shot on a 55 or a 35. A 35 even then is like pushing it on the wide side. But generally the higher the number, the more facial compression you'll get and the, flattering, the more flattering that portrait will look. Next, you wanna have your shutter speed set pretty high. With the higher your shutter speed, the less blur you'll get. So I actually like to shoot anywhere between 250 to 125. Anything below that, I'll worry about them. They're like maybe kind of like scrunching their face or getting any kind of camera shake blur or just motion blur in general. And I like to have my portraits look really, really sharp and really capture the details on someone's face. So to be honest, 200 to 250 is ideal. And now you may not be able to get that high because of like low light and stuff, but you know, that's where you can always set up your lights. As for aperture, this will be dependent on your lens, but I some I generally like to shoot my portraits at a pretty high aperture, depending on the background, because with a 55, pretty much everything behind your background will be blurred anyways. So generally somewhere between 5.6 to a 7.1, that way I have their entire face in focus. I hate the look of like having someone's eyes in focus, but their back hair isn't in focus, or like their nose, isn't, nose and eyes in focus, but their ears aren't in focus. I hate the look of those portraits. It looks kind of awkward. Although sometimes that can be tastefully done where the eyes are in focus and nothing else is in focus. It really draws your attention to the eyes. And that's more of an artistic choice than really a technical choice. And also you wanna make sure you have your ISO fairly low. Now I'd never like to go below uh, 800 ISO for my photos. Um, I think somewhere between 800 to maybe 2000 on this camera will be fine because anything above that, you'll start to get a little bit of grain. And personally, I like grain in all my photos, but if I'm doing portraits, I try to avoid as much grain as possible because I don't want to contaminate the skin texture. Like if someone has really smooth skin and then I put grain on that skin, it might make their skin look bad. So I try to avoid uh, avoid grain if possible but I don't like to go below 800 because after that you're just losing dynamic range and you're just like losing all the light that you have in there you're losing the subtlety of like the light maybe you have like a window light that you're using or just like really subtle evening light and I just don't want to lose the subtlety of that light so personally 800 is ideal for me and lastly you want to be in the I menu the information menu and you want to have face priority autofocus. Now, if you're gonna be doing portraits, there's definitely gonna be a face in it, and you want the autofocusing system to prioritize the face, and you wanna be in single servo, but if you're doing a portrait of maybe a model that's moving around or doing something interesting, you know, maybe kind of giving some cool looks, 
and you want to kind of capture all of that. Uh, Full-time servo could also work, but generally, I like to I prefer single servo because chances are I'm going to have my camera on a tripod or in a very stable area that and usually my camera's not going to be moving and the model's going to be doing really subtle turns. I prefer single servo, but I can see the need to do full-time servo if maybe it's a full body shot where the model is kind of moving their arms or kind of like flinging clothes around. But again, that's not really a portrait, but just I prefer single servo for portraits. Next, we're gonna talk about sports mode or something that's fast moving. And for something like that, first thing you wanna do is you wanna go into this little button right here. If you hit it, this menu right here will pop up called release mode. And now if you go to single frame, it's just taking one frame at a time. But if you go to continuous cell, as you hold the shutter button down, it will just take photos for you continuously. You can probably hear that shutter right there. And also, after that, there's high. Now, this is going to take photos really, really fast. So, depending on how fast you want these photos to go. Um, and then there's quiet release, but we'll talk about that later. And then there's self-timer. What I prefer for sports is just L. I find the continuous high is too fast. And sometimes it'll take fat photos faster than I need it to. And I can't refresh my raw buffer in time. So, and the raw buffer is the amount of photos it can take before the camera needs a second to save everything to the memory card. I prefer continuous L and that seems to do the best job for me. Um, I think you'll only need uh, continuous H, which is continuous high. If you're shooting something that's really fast moving, like a car or like a cheetah. So once you're in continuous L, you want to take your shutter speed and you want to really crank up that shutter speed because if something's moving fast, you don't want to get any motion blur. Unless you do, then you could set it really, really low. But chances are, if something's moving fast, you actually want to have your shutter speed high, like somewhere between 320 to 400. And now that will give you a very fast shutter speed. That'll be one 400th of a second. And that's how fast we'll take the photo. So as you can see, that's a very fast photo. But you will also lose light. But we'll talk more about how to fix that up later. And then depending on what you're shooting and how much light is in there, you actually want to turn your aperture up. Now, unless you're shooting in bright daylight, you will notice a very like sharp decrease in light. But if you're shooting in like a sports stadium outside, you really won't have to worry about light. But if you're shooting indoors or like a studio, if you're shooting a model kind of moving around, you will have to get extra lights if you're going to be shooting at a high aperture and a high shutter speed. Next, if you're going to be shooting someone that's fairly fast moving, I do recommend turning up your ISO just a little bit since we're not getting super close in on fine details. It's totally okay to set your shutter speed high. I would be totally comfortable setting it as high as 3200. So now if you notice, if I shoot at 3200, the previous photo that I took was dark. Now this is much, much brighter than the previous photo. And it's funny, I just noticed that that guy on the poster kind of looks like Frankenstein. But these are actually both Blade Runner photos which is uh, my favorite movie of all time, um, or both of them are two of my favorite movies of all time. And that is how you set the camera up for sports mode. You wanna have a high ISO because you will be losing light, a high shutter speed, a high aperture. You wanna be shooting at a high f-stop. And now in terms of what focal length, that just depends on how far your subject is. If you're shooting in a sports stadium and your subject is really far away, obviously you're gonna to have to get closer. But if you're pretty close to the action, you could actually shoot a teen and get wide shots and then crop into that photo later and that way you're not missing the action because maybe the subject's moving too fast for you to track on a closer focal length but if you're shooting wide you're getting everything and then you can just crop in later and pick whatever the best part of that shot is now the last thing i want to do is i want to give you guys a little bonus tip now chances are if you're someone that's just starting out in photography one of the things you're gonna get hired to do a lot is shoot events and conferences and quiet areas where people want photos, but having a camera shutter constantly go off can be disruptive. So what you wanna do is you wanna bring up your release mode menu and you wanna go right here to quiet shutter release. Now, when I hit the quiet shutter release, you'll actually notice it's not completely silent, but it's much, much quieter. Now, if you compare that noise to the single frame, it's way louder. Let's do that again versus it's a much more subtle and like softer sound but again it's not completely silent because at the end of the day this is an slr camera which has a little mirror that goes and that's how you take the photo um next 
if you're going to be shooting in a quiet environment, chances are you're probably going to be using indoor like ceiling lights and those things usually are not ideal for getting good image quality. So you want to make sure you're on manual here. Oops, a little too close to the camera. You want to make sure you're on manual and you want to go into active delighting and you want to set this to high. What this will do is it will really help catch all the dynamic range in your image. Like now, I don't know if you can really see it here, but uh, if I take this photo, it comes out like this. But now if I take that exact same photo with high lighting, there's just a lot more pop to it. It's just like not as dark. Like now we'll do a quick comparison as well. See, this is kind of like a bit dark and flat. And this, there's way more pop to that photo. So whenever you're shooting in like really, really dimly lit environments, we're just using like ceiling and indoor lighting that's not really made for photos. Turning active D lighting really, really helps because it really helps to make things pop and really like just boost the dynamic range of your camera. And if you're also doing that, want to make sure that you open up your aperture as much as you can. Um, my lens only goes up to 3.5 on the wide end and you want to lower your shutter speed to, I think 80 should be okay if people are just sitting around. And with that, you'll, this image will probably be overblown. Yep, it was overexposed. But with that, you'll get way, way more use out of your camera, especially in high stress environments where you don't have a lot of lighting and you're trying to capture a conference or an event. Yep. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us on our Nikon D5600 tutorial. If you are interested in this camera, be sure to check out the link in the description down below for the absolute best pricing on this camera. I really, really recommend this camera to people who are just starting in photography and eventually want to go pro. If you have any questions whatsoever about this camera, hit me up in the comments down below. I'll make sure to get back to every single one of you. As always, like and subscribe for future content. Until next time, guys.